Welcome to the Crosslight Tutorial Movie. This is a 3D TCAD simulation of a gallium nitride LED. The first step is to create a new project or it will work. We now use layer file to represent the initial growth of our structure using the Layer Builder GUI program. We start the structure from the end doping layer ignoring the substrate. So we use the Layer Builder GUI to define the thickness of the layer. And then we specify the macro uh, corresponding to this material. So the 0% algan corresponds to gallium nitride. And we specify here the doping concentration. Uh, this is the concentration of the dopants, not the concentration of the activated uh, carriers. We also specify the number of mesh lines in, the particular in that particular layer. We repeat the same procedure to define our barrier layer. Even though this material is gallium nitride, we're, all, we're going to use the INGAN macro so that this is considered a separate material from our end doping layer. Our next layer is going to be the in-GAN quantum well. Because this is an MQW region and the barrier and well layers repeat, we're going to save time by copying and pasting some of the layers we already defined. Our next layer is going to be the electron blocking layer. This layer is made of algan, so we here we specify the aluminum percentage. As a reminder, again, the p-doping defines the unionized doping concentration and not the measured whole concentration. We finish up with our last layer, which is going to be the p-contact layer. We finish our first step by saving the file. The error message is going to be ignored here because we're converting this simple 1D structure into a 3D stack by manually adding some code to the layer file. What we previously defined were the layer thicknesses and the mesh in the direction of the growth. 
So now we're using another command to define the extent of the simulation and the uh, mesh size in the plane of the wafer. We're now going to save the file, generate the mesh, and convert the entire project for use in our SemiCrafter GUI. When we open a SemiCrafter, on the right-hand side, we're going to see our layer stack. And on the middle panel, we have an area where we can draw the different process masks that we're going to use for this device. The first process mask we use in this device is going to be a circle, and that's going to be used to dig a trench. We can draw the circle on screen and then adjust any parameters that we need, like the center coordinates, the radius, or even the number of vertices that are used in the polygon that actually represents the circle in the process modeling. Every mask has a particular purpose, so here we're going to use, uh, be using an etch mask to remove material. The effective depth of the mask is specified by the segment number. So here we're going to specify segments 8 through 64, and that, effect, that determines which layers are going to be etched away using this circle. The second mask we're going to use to define a contact Again, we use a, con uh, a circle, but here we're going to use a different mask property called Change Material. Change Material is basically the equivalent of an etch and regrowth step, but we cheat a little bit and we simply transmute one material into another. So here we're going to say that all the algan in the affected area is going to be changed into a material we call Contact 1, and that's going to be used for the end contact. The effective area of the mask is uh, segment number 7, so it's just below the etched area that we already have. The last mask is similar to the second and is used to define the P-contact. We've defined all the process masks now, so we can save the file and generate the C-Supreme input files. The C-Supreme process simulator, we can now open the main.in template file that has been generated by SemiCrafter and run the, the project and vi visualize the structure we've created. In the C-Supreme process simulator, we're actually going to grow and process our structure. So we start by opening up the template that was created by SemiCrafter, and we're going to make some small changes to the code. First thing we're going to do is to change the name of the output file that's going to be used by Apsys. We're also going to turn on some options to generate additional information necessary for ray tracing and also disable the automatic definition of polarization charges. There's another model that we can use in Apsys to handle that part of the model.
After the process modeling is done, we can visualize the structure with cross light view. We're going to open the process directory and we're going to open the final STR file that was generated during the simulation. Rotating the structure, we see our two contact regions. And we can ver see various other quantities that have been calculated during the process modeling, such as the doping distribution. During the export, Stream has created an empty template for the device modeling. It's called main.sol. So here we're going to make a copy of this or uh, empty uh, original template and rename it so we can m make some modifications. Once we're in our uh, new template, we're going to make some modifications to it. Uh, we're going to remove some commands which are not necessary and we're going to add some models that are needed for LED simulations. Some of the important things that need to be done here is to define the direction of the quantum well normal because this is a 3D simulation. We also have to define the interface charge using the polarization charge model command and we have to turn on the self-consistent -qu self quantum well simulations. Now we can modify some settings related to the nonlinear solver. In Newton power, we can control the maximum number of iterations the solver is allowed to use, as well as the convergence criteria on the function residue and the variable tolerance. Every device simulation starts with the equilibrium calculations and after that we perturb the system by applying a, volt, a bias, be it voltage, current or light. Here we start with a voltage scan and because we cannot use a current scan straight from equilibrium. So we increase the voltage until it reaches a certain threshold current and after that we're going to switch over to a current scan. In order to improve convergence, there are several tricks that we can use. Here we're going to use a slow transient technique which adds a little bit of displacement current to the sparse matrix. It's almost equivalent to DC, but numerically it has some, uh, uh, some effects on the convergence. Now we can simply select simulate to start a device simulation.
after the device simulation, we want the results. So there are two systems that we can use. We're going to start by the PLT system, which is based on text file commands and is good for batch processing. It also happens to have more features that compared to our graphical tools. So we're going to start by creating an empty text file. And then we can edit this file in our main uh, Simuapsis program. We're going to be typing all the commands by hand, but there's a built-in wizard that can be used by new users to uh, facilitate this, uh, th this task. After the PLT file is done, we can view the results, and this will generate the PostScript output. So here we rely on GhostView and GhostScript to view the actual PostScript results. Now we've got our IV curve, IQE, and band diagrams. In addition to the PLT system, it's also possible to view results using Crosslight View. But here we're going to skip straight ahead to the ray tracing simulation. During the device simulation, we exported the ray tracing data, but the actual ray tracing modeling is done by a different program. So we're going to create two new text files, a raytrace.saw, which contains the commands to do the actual ray tracing, and a raytrace PLT, which will create com have kind of commands to plot the ray tracing results. This is going to be the last step of our simulation, and so thanks for watching.